I am terrible. Well, good morning once again. It is great to see you today. How many of you have ever found yourself saying, whose side are you on anyway? Or whose team are you on? You ever found, your, found yourself saying that? I've uh, played a little bit of basketball over my years, and um, there's, there's been a number of games that I've played, usually just, you know, pick up basketball, open gym, where I have found myself saying, Who's, whose team are you on? Like, the best player on their team is actually on my team. You know what I'm saying? Like, the continually turning the ball over, playing defense like a, a matador, like, go ahead, have right at it. Um, taking shots that seem to be sponsored by the letter Y. Like, whoa, why would you take that shot? That's just a terrible shot. Like, you are the best player on their team. Whose side are you on anyway? Occasionally... We'll have a little discussion like at a meal time, and um, it could be something trivial about what what shade a color is or something along that line and and Sela and I may be having a little bit of a friendly back and forth, and we bring in Mom and ask her and like you're supposed to side with the husband, you know this right, and she sides with Sela and like, "Hey, whose side are you on?" <laughs> And sometimes, sometimes we have those comments, we think, say those things, and, and they're lighthearted, and they're pretty jovial, and then there's other times where we, we really want to know. This is like something that really needs to be defined, right? Whose side are you on? You need to pick a side. You're either for us or against us. You're either with me or you're against me. Whose side are you on? As we go back and look at the story of Joshua, if you have your Bibles, love for you to turn there. We're going to look at the last part of chapter 5 and then a good chunk of chapter 6 today. If you didn't bring a Bible, you can grab one of the KWC Bibles there in front of you and turn to page 154 if you're grabbing one of those. You're welcome to follow along if you've got a smartphone or a tablet that you've got uh, the Bible on and can access it that way. Whatever uh, works best for you to be able to follow along and access God's Word. I'll have uh, most of this on the screen behind me, but I, I just, again, I think there's something really, really tangible and helpful to have it, have it right there in front of you where you can follow along and uh, sometimes even maybe be able to see things in a little bit of a different translation if that's what you have. So let's jump in, shall we? to Joshua chapter 5, and we're going to pick it up with verse 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Whose side are you on? Now, that's a that's a good question. And whose side are you on? He sees this man with a drawn sword. Like, are you on my side or not on my side? Because if you're on my side, then that, that's cool. If you're not on my side, I need to know so I can be prepared. Check this answer. Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. I'm not on your side and I'm not on their side. I'm on God's side. Now, I'm going to pause right here. It doesn't necessarily have a lot to do with, with what we're going to be discussing today completely, but it's worth spending a little bit of time on. As commander of the army of the Lord, who is this man that Joshua is talking to? There are a, a few different opinions on this matter. Some will say that this is what is referred to as a theophany, which is God uh, demonstrating himself in a likeness so that humanity can see it. Okay? Such as Moses' experience with the burning bush. God's presence in a tangible, visible way, but it's not actually seeing God himself. And so there's some that would suggest that this is God in, in a man's body saying, hey, I'm here, 
this is what's going on. And, and part of the reason why they would suggest that is because, well, after all, who is the commander of the army? Who's the number one in charge of the Lord's army? The Lord. So he said, well, that could make sense. There's many, and I would fall under this category, that would say that this most likely is an angel. That when we look at commander, it's not necessarily saying the commander in chief as we would look at it in, in our government setup, but as the one that's been given the responsibility for making sure that the rest of the angels do what they're supposed to do and all of that, and especially in military type ways, that this is the like head angel, if you will. Commander of the Lord's army. And part of the reason that I will would suggest that is because of what comes next. Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? When we see angels in scripture, typically there are two things that you will notice. One of two, sometimes both. Angels are warriors and angels are messengers. They're warriors and they're messengers. We'll talk about angels coming, that they're, they're doing this fight, they've been fighting, and who do angels fight? The devil, the devil demons, okay? They fight against sin. Well, a messenger, he's got a drawn sword, so messenger and a warrior. So it seems to me like could easily fit that he is an angel. It's also something of note that when he says that I, he's the commander of the army of the Lord, he uses the Lord, the name for God, the personal name for God. But then when, when Joshua bows to him, he's like, what do, what's your message, Lord? And the word that he use, uses for Lord there is just a common term for somebody that's in charge, a master, if you will. Look, so I'm showing deference to your position. Not saying that that's God, but showing recognition that you have a important position. Okay? So just a little bit of an understanding. He continues. Here's the message. The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. You see, the angel, I would say, I, my suggestion, is basically flipped it and said, no, it's not a whose side am I on, whose side are you on? It, it's not a matter of God being on our side, but really the question is, are we on God's side? Are we on God's team? Whose team are we on? And if you use this idea of team... And there's a little bit of a breakdown anytime you use an analogy with when it comes to God and the things of God, there's going to be a breakdown. We understand that, right? But if you look at it as a team, God's the owner, he's the coach, and he's the best player. And we're just happy to be able to share the ball with him, if you will, using that analogy. Okay? And so there's this kind of a line being drawn saying whose side are you on? I'm, I'm commander of the Lord's army. Are you going to be on his side or are you going to be on the other side? It's not a matter of God being on your side. You either get on his side or you're not on his side because you're either for him or you're against him. And Joshua did so. He, he recognized that God is God. And so he's like, I'm going to be on your team. So here's the game changer and then we'll unpack this as we go through the rest of chapter 6. You're guaranteed victory if you stick to God's game plan. If you stick to God's game plan. Do you realize God's got a game plan for your life? In scripture we see God's game plan. And in Joshua chapter 6, God's going to give a specific game plan, if you will, for the battle of Jericho. And victory is guaranteed if they'll stick to God's game plan. So let's go to chapter 6. 
shall we? Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. Now archaeologists will tell us a variety of things about Jericho and what they've done in the excavations on the wall of Jericho. And consensus is Jericho itself was not a large city as far as inhabitants go. That there were not a lot of people there in, in comparison to a lot of the other major cities of the time. But that the walls of Jericho were very intimidating. That 11 to 12 feet high, even some say it suggests maybe about 14 feet. There were two different walls. There was the outer wall that was about 11 to 14 feet. And then there was an interior wall that would have been anywhere from 30 to 40 feet tall, most archaeologists will suggest. Very intimidating, going all the way around the city. Basically impossible to penetrate, impossible to get through. And yet... The residents of Jericho are afraid. Why are they afraid? Because they have heard of the mightiness of God. How awesome God is. So they're afraid. But I want us to look at this part that I have highlighted here. God says to Joshua, See, I have delivered. But they're on the outside of the gates, right? They're on the outside of the wall. The wall has not come down. There's not a crack in the wall. There's not, there's not a way to say, well, yep, the game's over. The game's not over, right? I mean, this, this is like at the beginning of the game. They're just getting ready to conquer Jericho. And God's saying, see, I've delivered them. He's speaking into the future as it's already happened. How can he do that? What? He knows the future. How does he know the future? He's God. And he's not confined by time in space. And whatever he says, if he says it's going to happen, guess what? It's going to happen. But there's something on our side of things. We have to have what we call faith, right? Because we can't see into the future. We can't see what we can't see. We can only see what we can see. But faith requires us to be able to trust and to believe in something we can't see. See, I've delivered. I, I can't see that they've been delivered. I see that they're afraid. But I still see this big wall. So here's a great definition of faith that I think will help us out came across this several years ago and I just really love this definition. Believing in what we can't see because of what we can see. There are many people that have come to faith in God believe that there is a God because they look around. I mean if you have been outside, how many of you have been outside in the last you know 24, 48 hours? Uh, all of you should raise your hand. You did drive in today, right? Okay. Nobody was camping out here that I know of. Um, did, have, you, have you looked around creation? How, how many of you saw like a sunset in the last couple days? And go, okay, there's, there's got to be a God. Look at that beautiful, gorgeous sunset. How many of you have witnessed the birth of a child? If you haven't, I, I'm telling you, there's something about witnessing the birth of a child. Especially when it's your child. And like going, wow God, you are amazing. And you start learning more about how the human body is made. I mean, scientists have been at this for years. And they're still discovering more and more and more information about the human body. And then we go even beyond that to, to the galaxy and everything. And just like, okay, because of what I can see, I'm going to believe in what I can't see. 
And Joshua has, is looking at what he can see, what he has experienced. Okay, we crossed the Red Sea. I saw that. So I have faith. That gave me faith so that when God said, okay, now we're going to cross the Jordan River that we talked about last week, and you're going to have the, the priests take the Ark of the Covenant, and as soon as they step foot into the, the Jordan River, I'm going to part the river, and you're going to walk across on dry land. Well, it took faith to do that, but they were believing what they couldn't see because of what they could see. I trusted God in the past. I saw God move in the past, and I believe he can do that again. He'll do it again because he said this is what he's going to do. So the priest, when they set foot in the water, the water parts. And when Joshua is brought to the walls of Jericho and God says, see, I've delivered them into your hands, I believe Joshua says, okay, I trust that. I have faith in that because God, you have shown me that that I can trust you. I'm going to trust you for what's ahead because of what I can see behind me. What I can see going on around me. So faith. Let me go back to sticking to God's game plan. It takes faith to trust God for his game plan, right? So okay, I'm going to trust God that you know what you're talking about. Why do we trust God that he knows what he's talking about? Because he's God. And because he's proven himself as we read his word that he knows what he's talking about. That we can have faith. That we believe in what we can't see because of what we can see. Verse 3. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's worms in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the, with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Do you guys get the game plan here? Does this sound like a reasonable game plan for conquering a city? Does this sound like something that like we, we've done we've done a lot of research and we've got a game plan. This is how we're gonna go about this. Okay? We we know that the walls of Jericho are they're intimidating. We know that most people would look at that and go, that is insurmountable. There's no way we're getting through there. You know what? Here's what we're going to do, guys. We're going to get up camp. We're going to break camp the first day. We're going to march around the city one time. We'll blow trumpets a little bit. We'll carry this ark around, but that, that's going to be it. No hammers, no dynamite, anything like that. We're just going to walk around, okay? And we'll come back. Second time, we're, we're, next day we're going to do the same thing. Third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. On the seventh day, we're actually going to walk around it seven times. And then we're going we're gonna to blow the, the trumpet really loud and long. And then we're all going to shout. And then we're going to go straight in. Team, on, on three. Ready? One, two. <laughs> and and you've you got to be saying, oh. Um... Did one of the assistant coaches come up with this game plan or something? Because this, this just does not sound, this doesn't sound real, real great. But what did they do? Joshua had commanded, commanded the army, do not give a war cry. He goes on and he passes on the, the information to all of them. He passes it on to the priests and then he passes it on to the rest of the soldiers. They, Command of the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. I, I love what I see here. I don't know if you see this or not. So just in case you don't see it, I see it and you don't see it, I want to help you see it. Did God tell Joshua not to have the people even talk? You can look at it. You can consult your, your text there. He just told them to shout on the last day. He didn't say that they couldn't talk when they were walking around the city wall. But God did tell them to wait till the seventh day and the seventh lap completed and the trumpet had sounded before they shout. 
Joshua is a tremendous leader. He doesn't always get it right, but Joshua gets it right the majority of the time. And I love what he does here. Instead of just telling the people not to shout until the seventh day, after the seventh lap, after the trumpet blows, Joshua tells them, don't shout. Don't even raise your voice. And in fact, you know what? Don't even say a word as we're marching around the city. Why do I think that's brilliant? Here's why. I think Joshua knows how people are. And you start marching around, and especially when you, you start to get a crowd of people, and they're walking, what happens? They're talking. What happens? It happens even in here on Sunday mornings as we're doing the little, like, you know, the, the countdown or whatever, music's playing, and this is great. We got to talking and talking and talking, and it's, it's a little noisy in here. And it's a, it's a great noise, but it builds. It's the same thing that happens in a classroom, right, teachers? You get a little bit of talking, and then somebody else has to talk a little louder so that they can be heard. And, and then it's, it starts, what, what started as a whisper becomes like a shout because there's more people, and they want to be heard. And Joshua said, just, you know what? No talking. I also love it because typically you're more likely to really be reflecting and thinking what's going on if you're not talking. It's, it's harder to really think what, what is God doing? What is God about to do? God, what, what would you even be saying to me during this moment? Like, I think this was a great opportunity. I think this is like discipleship 101, learning to listen to God. Keep your mouth shut. You're going to walk around. And as you walk around, you're going to be able to sense and hear God speaking to you. And we're going to wait till that seventh day, after the seventh lap, after the horn blows the extended time, before we shout. So let me give a little bit of an application, shall we? I think too often when we hear something, God says, don't do this, we say, well, how close to that can I get? When I was working in youth ministry, we talked about sex quite a bit. Sex is a topic that teens... I don't know if they like to talk about, but they need to hear about it fairly frequently, a reminder of God's ways, God's standards. And truth be told, adults probably need to hear about it just as much or more than teenagers. God's standards. But the question that I would have once in a while come up in one form or another is basically, how far is too far? And if you're asking how far is too far... In this area or in any area, I think that's the wrong question. How close to sin can I get? Well, how about how far away from sin can we get? Instead of how close to the edge, how f let's give ourselves some distance here. Instead of just telling them not to shout, he's like, well, you know what? Don't raise your voice. And then he's like, you know what? Actually, for, you, for us, let's, we're not even going to talk. And I think the Holy Spirit is at work, and I trust the Holy Spirit to help really take that home a little bit more. What that means, maybe financially, maybe what that means in your dating relationships, or other relationships, or what that means in other areas of life. Instead of saying, how close do we get, you know what, we're going to, the way we put this uh, several years ago in a series that we did, we talked about bumpers. You remember that? Some of you. Like, we're going to put up some guardrails. We're going to put up some bumpers so we don't go in the ditch. We don't go in the gutter. We stay away from getting into areas where God would not have us to go. And I think there's some great things that Joshua does here. So that they have that all set up, right? So we have faith. 
second word, obedience. Stick to God's game plan. A lot of times when I hear about teams after they've lost, one of the number one things that they'll say afterwards is we failed to execute the game plan. Coaches had a great game plan set up and we failed to execute the game plan. We, we didn't obey. We didn't follow God's plans. Okay? When, when we mess up in life, when life doesn't go too well, it usually is because we haven't been following God's game plan. And here's the thing. The Israelites, they had to follow God's game plan even when they didn't make sense. March around the city seven days, seventh day seven times. That doesn't make sense. Give me some dynamite. You know, a chisel, something. I mean, I want to do something active, right? I want to do something that I can see this, this likely, it may take a while. It may be hard, hard work, but this at least seems like this would work. And you're saying just march around it, and then on the seventh day, after the seventh time around, the long blast, and we shout, then the wall is going to be leveled, and we'll go straight in. And here's where I think a lot of us mess up when it comes to life and following God's game plan. We start thinking we know better than God. And go, God, I think you're a little out of date on this one. You got to get with the times. We're, we're doing things a completely different way now. I mean, after all, love is love. God, we're going to go with a different game plan. We like this one better. And we'll lose. We won't experience victory. Because victory is only guaranteed. And we'll talk more about it next week. What happens when you don't follow God's game plan. But victory is only guaranteed if you'll stick to God's game plan. And that means obeying. It means following God's plans even when they don't make sense. Financially. It, it, it doesn't make sense really. I mean to tithe. To give your first 10%. It doesn't make sense. You do the math. I mean like for most households it, it doesn't make sense. But you know what? Following God's game plan w would you know it? It works. It doesn't make sense. You do the math. It, like, eh, it doesn't really make, it doesn't make sense but I'll, I'll just tell you from experience it works. Amen. It works. Follow God's game plan, even when they don't make sense. On the seventh day, okay? So on the seventh day, they, they did the same thing for six days. On the seventh day, here we go. Seven times around. Seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. We're going to get a little bit of a chance to shout it. Are you okay with shouting today? Yeah. Yeah? Are you okay with shouting today? Yeah. Yeah. How many of you are familiar with the, the Marines, the U.S. Marines and the U.S. Army? Familiar? A little bit familiar? How, how many of you know the shout that the U.S. Marines have? Okay, the other shout. Hoorah! Hoorah! Okay, Marines shout, Hoorah! And the U.S. Army shouts, Oh, man. Our military's in trouble. <laughs> Nobody knows what the, what the, army, the army shouts? You, you guys think this is a pastor joke set up, don't you? You're like, we're afraid because you're going to give us some. Okay, here's, here's what the army shouts. I looked this up. It's got to be true. It was on the internet. <laughs> okay, the U.S. Marines shout, Hoorah! The U.S. Army shouts, Hoorah! Sounds pretty, pretty similar. 
but they're different. They have their own unique ones. And a U.S. Marine would never shout what a U.S. Army soldier would shout, unless maybe they're in battle and they're showing camaraderie, right? Vice versa. The, the word that Scripture uses here for shout, what we have here is, is the word ruah. It sounds kind of like those. And, and I don't know that this is actually what they shouted, but it just seems like that's something you can shout. Ruah! I mean, doesn't that... Okay, some of you aren't feeling it. Maybe, maybe I just read this a lot more than you've read it and getting into this ruah and everything, but, but when I read ruah and I like shout, and after I've been walking around the, the city for six days now, seventh day, and finally seven times around, I'm ready to shout. And let, let, let's bring it down, bring the house down. Ruah! ruah. So on the count of three, all right, I'm going I'm to blow the trumpet. And then we're going to all shout together, Rua! Don't leave me alone on this. <laughs> that would not be kind. One, two, three. Rua! Rua! All right, you guys didn't listen. I said, one, two, three, I'm going to blow the trumpet, then you shout. <laughs> Can you imagine what Joshua was dealing with? <laughs> He had more people than he had more people to deal with than I do today. <laughs> All right, so seven times around. One, two, three. Ruah! Ruah! All right. <laughs> Can you imagine though? Can you imagine? We've gone around it s s seven days now. seventh time around, or seventh day, we got to go around this city seven times. That's, that's quite a journey. I mean, think, like, just walking around Kingston seven times. Some of you are kind of thinking that's exhausting, especially if you're carrying some other stuff going on. You know, you got some, some armor on, all this, like, can we just give up? Can we just go ahead and shout Ruah? I mean, because that was kind of fun, right? Can we just go ahead and shout? Can we go ahead and just go on in? Okay, I'm tired of doing all this. Let's, let's just get going. Or and there are probably even some that were ready to just, just give up. Scripture gives us a little bit of um, extra right here after verse 16. Verses like 17, 18, and 19 kind of fill in a little bit more of what's going on, okay? So part of that is Joshua gives some instructions. He tells the two spies that we talked about a couple weeks ago. He tells them, hey guys, you guys are going to go in and you're going to go to Rahab's house and you're going to bring them to safety, okay? You guys made a promise and I'm going to up I'm going to help you uphold that promise. Again, a, a great leadership principle here. And I think something that parents can learn from. Okay? Helping your children follow through on their commitments. Helping them learn that what it means to be a person of their word. Okay? And Joshua says, you know what? You made this promise. You made this commitment. There's nobody else that knows better where to find Rahab's house than the two guys that made the promise. The two guys that had already been to her house. So you made the promise. You're going to follow through on that promise. We're going to protect Rahab and her family. And we're going to use you to do it. She's, she already knows who you guys are. So recognize your faces. You know where the house is. You're going to follow through on that promise. So that's part of what we see in 17, 18, and 19. The other thing that we see is kind of a little bit of a foreshadowing, if you will. But Joshua gives instructions to the Israelites. When we go in... We're going to conquer everything. We're going to destroy everything. The silver and the gold we can take. We're going to go ahead and grab that. We're going to take it back and we're going to commit that. We're going to devote that to the Lord. We'll repurpose it, if you will. 
We can burn that down. We can melt it, remelt it, and, and put that into the Lord's treasuries. But there are some things that you are to completely stay away from. If you don't completely stay away from these items of destruction, it will destroy you and it will bring destruction upon us. And so Joshua gives this warning. Again, it's a, lot, it's a little bit of foreshadowing for what's to come in chapter 7, which we'll look at next week. But they march around the city seven times, blow the trumpet, they shout. When the, when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. A couple things real quickly. Scripture does not say that the whole wall completely went down. Okay. So archaeologists, some of how they can tell better how the, the height and some of that, because the whole wall wasn't destroyed. They didn't need the whole wall destroyed. They need, just needed a, lar a large enough section of wall to be destroyed for them to go straight in. And if we remember back a couple chapters ago, we, we know that Rahab's house was part of the wall. So if the wall falls, if the whole wall falls, guess what? Rahab's in trouble. Okay? So scripture does not say that the whole wall fell, but the wall collapsed, so everyone charged straight in and they took the city. So our third word perseverance. You see, the army had to show Joshua and the Israelites, they had to demonstrate faith, trust God's game plan, which means obedience. We have the faith, and if we really believe that God is who he says he is, then we should obey. We trust him, and so we obey him. Well, it's not enough to just have obedience for a while, it has to be continual. You've got to stick to it. Perseverance, sticking to God's game plan to the end. They stuck with it to the end. And they saw and experienced victory. Let's see. Trayton, you're right. And I'm going to pick on you. Can you come up here? How many of you have heard of the... The uh, tightrope walker, Charles Blondin. It's, it's been a while, like a couple centuries ago. He was famous for taking a tightrope, stretching it across Niagara Falls. Yeah. Good news is I'm not going to make you walk a tightrope. Okay. Stretched a tightrope across Niagara Falls. How many of you have been to Niagara Falls? So you have a little, maybe a little bit of a visual or at least have seen pictures of Niagara Falls. Okay. So stretch a tightrope across Niagara Falls from the American side to the Canadian side. He made a number of trips across the tightrope on different occasions, sometimes multiple trips on the same day. He started adding different things to this show, if you will, of, you know, like he, he took a, um, like a stove across or whatever and then cooked an omelet and then lowered the omelet down to uh, the ones that were on the Maid of the Mist. And he, he just, he, he took a, one of those big um, photograph things, you know, cameras, the old style and took a picture of the crowd on the other shore and he just did a variety of things. One occasion, and some of you have probably heard this one before, he took a wheelbarrow and he walked the wheelbarrow across and he came back and like, how many of you believe I could carry a, a man in this? He, after he take like a, a bag of potatoes, like, how many of you believe uh, I could put a human in here and walk them across and back? I'm like, yeah, we believe. And like, anybody willing to get in the wheelbarrow? Like, uh -uh, not going to happen. Well, if you look it up, you can see that on one occasion he took his manager and I don't know that day if he asked for volunteers or if he just said, you know what, this is what we're going to do. But he took his manager and he had his manager get on his back. So we're going to do a little piggyback. Okay. Okay. And he had special setup. I'm thankful I picked Trayton and not a few other people that are here today. Okay. He had somebody about his own size. And it was set up where the feet were kind of in stirrups. He had his balancing pole. And he started to walk across the tightrope. 
And he told his manager, don't look down. Well, wouldn't you know it? As he was going across, the manager looked down, and he's starting to freak out a little bit. He's having problems. And Blondin basically says, he calls his manager by name, and he says, you are no longer the, la the last name of his, his manager. You are now Blondin. You doing all right back there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Need a boost? Yeah. All right. That's good. All right. So you, you're no longer... That calls him by his last name. You, you are now Blondin. What I do, you do. If I lean, you lean. If, for some reason, I start to kind of lose balance, you do not try to balance yourself. Because if you do, we'll both go down. That's a great picture of faith. You guys give Trayton a hand. Okay. He's like, okay, let me know. Can you imagine being at least 190 feet above water, raging water, and all of that? Like, you see the picture? Right, right there in that little illustration, all three things. The manager had to have faith. Like, okay, it's all on, the, it's all on Blondin. Blondin's the one with his feet on the rope, right? That's the only way across. I'm going to trust you. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to have faith. I'm going to obey. I'm going to work with you. Perseverance. I'm going to stick. I'm going to hang on to the very end. That's the, that's the only way the manager gets across. Because of faith, obedience, and perseverance. Some of you memorized a uh, scripture verse. It was one of the ones that was in the Sunday school challenge. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And He, here's where some of you had it. There's two different ways. And He will direct your paths and there's another translation that says, and he will make your paths straight. So let's go back to Joshua 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord. Whose team are you on? With all your heart. Faith. Believing in what we can't see because of what we can see. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Wait, I don't see it, but I'm going to trust, right? In all your ways, acknowledge Him. So we have obedience and perseverance. Acknowledge Him. That means He's God, so I'm going to listen to Him. I'm on His team. It's not He's on my team. I'm going to acknowledge Him. I'm going to divert to His authority. I'm going to submit to that. I'm not just going to go, okay, God, and then do my own thing. I'm going to submit to that. Obedience. Even when it doesn't make sense. And Scripture says, and He will make my paths straight. So Joshua, we believe, we trust the game plan. We're going to obey. We're going to walk, walk that out. And we're going to keep walking that out until the very end. And what did God do? The walls came down and what did scripture say? And they went straight in. And he will make your paths straight. A guaranteed victory if you'll stick to God's game plan. I think a lot of us, it's not so much the issue of faith. We we, we believe God. We trust God. It's, it's taking that trust to obedience. And then obedience to perseverance, I think, is where most of us have the issue. Somewhere in those two, obedience or perseverance, is where I think God's going to get you today. And say, this is what we need to work on. Here's my plan. And you haven't been working it. 
you haven't been living by it. You've been doing your own play. You, you've been calling audibles, to use a little bit of a football reference. You've been, you've been changing things. You think you see something that I haven't planned for, that I don't know about. Stick to the game plan. Obey. Even when it doesn't make sense. And stick with it till the end. You're guaranteed victory. I invite our praise team to make their way back up as well as the ushers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, for this day and opportunity again to worship you, to hear from your word. Father, I thank you that you are a trustworthy God. You're a God that we can believe in. A God that, that is an amazing God. Nothing, absolutely nothing is too difficult for you. Father, you see what we can't see. You know what, you know what we don't know. You know all things. And God, with knowing that, help us, help us to obey you. Even when things don't seem to make sense. Even when it, the math doesn't work. Even when others are shouting, this is what we need to do. God, help us to obey you in everything. And help us to persevere. Help us to stick with it, no matter what. Even when life gets hard. Help us to stick with it. Knowing that you are good all the time. That you're still God. And so God, hear our praise as we worship you with our lips, as we honor you with our pocketbooks, and most of all, may we honor you with our lives. We pray this in and for your name. Amen.
last song, I just want to uh, invite Rudge to make his way forward. At some point during the song, he's asked to be anointed this morning. And if the men of the church that would like to gather around Rudge in prayer, I invite you to come. And anyone else that would like to come and pray at the altar during this last song, I invite you to come as well. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. you are Lord, Lord of all, the sovereign God, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is and was 
and is to come. The one who knows the future from the beginning. The one who sees all and knows all. The one who is our healer. And Father, as your word has invited, Raj in obedience and by faith, trusting that you are still God, has asked to be anointed today. We ask, Lord, that you would do for him what your will allows. Knowing, Lord, that you are able to do the impossible. You're able to do all things. And so, Father, we anoint him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, asking that you would work for his good. But more than that, asking that you would work for your glory. For this doctor that Rudge asked if he believed in divine healing. Didn't seem to really have a response. God, I pray that the next time they meet, he'll have a response. Yes. God, that you would be known. That you would be glorified. Father, we know that there are other needs that are represented here today as well. And we ask that you would meet each one of them. Thankful that you know each heart. Each situation. You know exactly what they need. I pray that you would meet that through Christ Jesus. That you would give wisdom to those that need wisdom. Those that need a physical touch that you would provide that. For reconciliation and restoration. In all areas, Lord, that you would work and have your way. Again, that you would work for our good. But God, if that is the end of our prayer, we fall short. We want you to be glorified. We want the name of Jesus to be known. To surrender to your Lordship. And so we pray and ask these in and for that name. Amen. And amen. You are dismissed. Thank you for coming today. God bless you.